Good morning. I'm Lydia Polgreen, editor in chief oh. of the Huff Post and uh, former editorial director at the New York Times, longtime foreign correspondent. Um, and I'm also an ardent follower of women's issues, which is why I'm so pleased to be able to introduce you to my guest today. Uh, they're both women who felt so strongly about something that they were prepared to take on not just naysayers, but their governments as well. Each has had to endure personal hardship and pain. They're joining me today to talk about why they're willing to risk so much and what sacrifices they've had to make along the way. Thank you for being here, uh, Moody Al-Jahani and uh, Masi Alinejad. I knew I was going to put you there. <laughs> Difficult <Welcome>. name. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm very thrilled to be here. And this is the first time of my life I feel that I'm empowered enough to share my story with you guys. Yes. And thank you so much. Well, I mean, obviously both of you uh, got your start in activism at a very young age. Masi, what attracted you to fighting life's injustices? You once wrote that the revolution took your body hostage. Yeah. Hi, everyone. <laughs> this is my fifth time being in Women in the World, but it's still nervous. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> yes. What I, lit your fire? <clears throat> I grew up in a small village in northern Iran. And when I uh, was born, the revolution happened. So I was two years old. So as I said, um, the revolution took my body hostage. The first thing that the Islamic Republic did was to write their own ideology on our bodies. We, the women, are the one carrying the most visible symbol of Islamic Republic on our body, which is this, the compulsory hijab. And, um, you know, when I was a kid, I never had a clue about freedom of choice, never had a clue about feminism or equality, nothing. I just had a little brother, two years older than me, had all the freedom that I wanted to have. So that was the reason that I had to fight for freedom because I wanted to be as equal as my brother who was able to jump in the river, who was able to show his hair, who was able to sing, who was able to play with boys around outside. But all of these things, I was banned from doing it. So I used my power to make my brother to understand my pain because I grew up in a small poor village. We didn't have inside bathroom, so we had to go to outhouse. My brother, the king of the day, who was scared of the darkness <laughs> during the night, but my mother told me how to defeat the darkness. My mother told me just any time when you're scared of the darkness, just remind that darkness is like a monster. When you stare into the darkness, then the darkness will disappear. But if you're scared of the darkness, the darkness will devour you. So I learned how to open my eyes as wide as I could. I said to my brother, if you want to go out and uh, without me, because he was scared of the darkness, I'm not going to take you to the outhouse <laughs> until you take me out to teach me how to ride a bicycle, how to run freely. So that is how I gained my freedom. Basically, the Islamic Republic actually took my body hostage, but I started my own revolution from my family's house. Wow. Yeah. Um, so how about you, Moody? You, you became almost an accidental activist. Um, right. You know, you were attending school in the United States. Um, there were some disagreements with your family. Tell us the story of how you um, became an activist and had to go into exile. Well, first of all, I was actually angry. So this is how it started. I think I exceeded the level of tolerance. And from there, I started being an activist. Um, so I was a student, as you know, just going to college. Uh, it took me a lot of years to convince my family because being a Saudi woman uh, means that you are an you live like an ongoing trial. Mm. You have to prove yourself every time. I have to behave a certain way just to, you know, tell them that I can do it. I want to study. I want to prove myself just for them to let me go. So when that happened, um, I went to visit back my family in Saudi Arabia. And 
apparently. I mean, you'd been in the U.S. I mean, in, in Saudi, there is this system of male guardianship, right? right. Women's all of women's life life decisions are essentially exactly. made for them by their male guardian. Right. Um, and you'd come and become a student in the United States where you didn't have to worry about any of that. No, I had to because the reason how I went to to the United States it was because of my guardian. Right. Consent, but once my guardian was angry at me, this is where the, he canceled my scholarship when I went back to visit Saudi Arabia. So it literally just affected me, even being a privilege with a nice family or being a non-privilege with a not nice family. So anybody, there is no guarantee if somebody's angry at you, so you can just lose your job. Or so you came something. home and you were basically a prisoner in, in your own home. Exactly. So it was a kind of disagreement, me being too westernized, I guess. So it was um, something unacceptable for the family. So they're like, okay, you're not going back. So here I started being very angry for eight months. I was locked in my own house, um, wasn't you know allowed to do anything, lost my scholarship, lost my study. It was my dream, like, of working years towards that mm. and it's just gone so that eight months of my life being locked in my house created this anger that I really have to do something about it in the beginning it was an accident as I told you I was writing all kind of organizations emails when I was locked and um, I, I wanted to do something and here when I started um, with the Human Rights Watch about um, what started the male guardianship uh, campaign revolution yep. where they started the... Well, you eventually managed to get your passport back yep. um, and, uh, and sneak out, I mean, almost under cover of darkness. Exactly. That, yeah. that will happen. And um, I took the chance. It was the only opportunity after eight months. So I ran away, and I'm here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's great. Um, So, Masi, you were arrested for the first time, I believe, when you were just 18 years old as a student. 19, yeah. Oh, 19, yeah. Um, how, how did you end up getting arrested at such a young age, and um, what was that experience like? I was a student. I got involved in student activities, and my only crime was just spreading pamphlets around against the government. And... Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> My only crime was only. that. <laughs> now, I, I, was a, I was a naughty girl. I got kicked out from school because of uh, asking so many questions. Then um, I became a journalist, and I got kicked out from Iranian parliament because of asking so many questions again. <laughs> and I became a columnist. Then I criticized the former president of Iran again. Um, I got kicked out from my newspaper. At the end, I got kicked out from my beloved homeland. And, um, and I remember that uh, because I experienced a lot of darkness in my life. So my mom, who's never you know, went to university or a school, is not even able to read and write. She's a tiny woman with big heart. But she told me to be powerful. Instead of waiting for someone to come and save you, be your savior. Instead of victimizing yourself, just you know, uh, be the warrior. So. I got kicked out from everywhere. My mom used to tell me that you were naughty enough if your dad would just kick you out from a room and lock the door, you were able to find a window and sneak into the same room. So now they kicked me out from Iran. I found my window. Social media is my window. And I'm there every day, every day, believe me. Believe me, I use my personal story to empower women like me. Instead of waiting for leaders to come and rescue you, to save you, be your own savior. So one day I was in London because of my campaign and what I have been doing. I got attacked by a pro-regime guy in London airport. He called me ugly woman. You're ruining the image of Iran. And I said, wait a minute, I'm not ruining the image of Iran. I'm ruining the image of the oppressors. And this is the Islamic Republic ruining the image of Iran, not me and the women who are protesting against the oppressive laws. So he was not convinced. And <laughs> that didn't bother me. That didn't bother me. What bothered me, he called me ugly. <laughs> <laughs> this is the way they actually, they want to patronize women. They want to attack women. They want to keep us silent. You yeah. know from Saudi Bully. Arabia. Mm -hmm. They're bullying you. Mm -hmm. They think if they say you're ugly, you're going to feel miserable and cry. Right. So what I did... I took my camera because I knew that I'm the most beautiful woman in the world. <laughs> I, went, I ran after the guy and I said, 
Now, honestly, why I say I'm the most beautiful? Because in the eyes of my son, I'm a beautiful mother. In the eyes of my mother, I'm a beautiful daughter. In the eyes of my husband, I'm a beautiful wife. Never let people tell you you're ugly. And the government called me ugly duckling. They don't know even the end of the story of ugly duckling. So I went, <laughs> I went, I went. <laughs> so, no, listen, this is the important part. This is the important part. I ran after that guy. I took my camera and I said to the guy, you called me ugly. Repeat yourself in front of my camera. <laughs> Guess what happened? He couldn't. <laughs> so I won the battle. So I shared my story with Iranian people right. and I launched my own version of Me Too movement in Iran. I said, anytime you're being harassed, you're being attacked, you're being bullied, use your mobile. Because you go to judiciary system, they put the blame on women. If you don't put headscarf on yourself, then they blame you. You're being raped, it's your fault. Mm -hmm. So use your mobile phone and film them. So now women, filming the, har the, the harassers, the people who are attacking them, the morality police, and they send the videos to me. One of the women sent the video, it got 9 million views. The supreme wow. leader of Iran doesn't get that much views. The president <laughs> of Iran doesn't get, that shows the power of ordinary women. That shows they kicked me out from Iran, but I am there because of the millions of Iranian women who are powerful enough to be warriors rather than a victims. Wow. That gives me the power. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know why you said you were nervous. You don't seem nervous to me. <laughs> no, because I'm homesick. Yeah, of course. And we'll come. We'll come back. I wanted to, Moody to talk to you about um, exile. I mean, you made this dramatic escape from Saudi, um, and you get to the United States. But it hasn't exactly been a bed of roses here for you. Talk about right. your experience of arriving in the U.S. and um, you were detained for some time. Um, right. Uh, well, that was a very shocking for me. Um, I, I kind of experience right now being an immigrant. So I can relate to women from Honduras, from Spain, from Colombia, wh whatever, from Haiti. Um, I was detained by ICE. Hmm. And it was a very traumatic experience for me because I, I left Saudi Arabia, I left MBS, and now I'm here trapped with, with Trump, want to be deported. So it's like, is there any place for me? Hmm. So it was a story of uh, just, um, a very silly um, communication with a police officer. Just, mm. you know, wrong place, wrong time. And, um, you know, when, a, when an officer wants to take somebody to jail and they really don't know what to charge them with, it would be a like, disorderly conduct or something like that. So sure. it, was, it was that, that is, like, what, something very silly. Mm. And it was the worst day, night of my life. Mm. And after that, um, I was an immigration hold. And I had no idea what does that mean until... Mm drove me two hours north of Florida with, um, it was an ICE detention center. Hmm. And I spent around the worst two weeks of my life wow. being wow. very overpunished for whatever the communication that happened with the police officer. Wow. So the, the, the short story from, from that, what, what I'm trying to say is it's just, there is no safe place for people like me. Mm. It's just, and you're an asylum seeker. You came to the U.S. seeking asylum. Exactly. And this is the first thing that happened. They tried to make me sign a paper so I get deported but with my deportation officer. Wow. And I definitely refused. But it was, uh, I experienced so many things going on there. Mm. I've met a lot of people who uh, were there over driving over suspended license, people who had felonies, people who had uh, nothing, just were the same yeah. way, wrong place, wrong time. There have been, you know, a, a lot of stories there. Yeah. One of the stories that was next to me, she lost her baby wow. right in wow. front of my eyes. And um, things like that happened, yeah. and yeah. I, I was there. And in this, in this climate, I mean, obviously, you know, the, the Muslim ban, uh, you know, under this, this administration, trying to keep people uh, from coming into the country. Um, uh, you experienced this personally. I mean, you, you're, you're here, Mazi, with, um, and, and your son is in the UK, and he's not able to come, come visit you. Trump listening to me? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, travel ban, only affects people like me. 
um, affects human rights activists, students, those people who want to escape from the oppressors. And um, believe me, right now, the relative of the officials, the Islamic Republic officials, they are here. They have green card. They can easily travel. If you want to ban people, go and ban them. <laughs> because those were the people who took the Americans hostage after the revolution. And they say, death to America. They brainwash us to say death to America from our childhood. And now they send their relatives here in America. And travel ban doesn't affect the oppressors, doesn't affect the Revolutionary Guard people, doesn't affect the relative of the uh, Islamic Republic officials. I haven't seen my son for one year and a half, but the first wall has been built in front of me and millions of Iranians by the Islamic Republic. I haven't seen my parents, my family for 10 years. That was why I was nervous, because it's not easy to talk that loud and have a loud voice and not being worried about your family back there. So. And, and, you know, in the last couple of days, there's been some very distressing news. Um, your, your mother, 70 years old, uh, she was paid a visit by the yes. security services. Can you tell us about that? Yes. My, you know what happened? For, the, for what I have been doing here, first, they ignored me. They denied me. Then, they humiliated me. They patronized me. Then, when they saw, it's not only me. It's millions of other women. They're not waiting for me. They are brave enough to lead the movement within the society. So they film themselves. They send it to me. And I'm only their voices. So they went after the people. And they arrested the White Wednesday's movement activists, which I'm going to explain what Wednesday's movement is. So, and then they brought my family on Iranian state television to disown me publicly. My mother refused to go. My mother, she's just from a small village. She's a true feminist. She said, if you come to my house, I will burn myself. She refused to go on Iranian national TV. They took my sister, because we, my sister does, doesn't believe in what I have been doing. So she went on TV, and she disowned me publicly. They wanted to break me. They called me a whore. They called me a prostitute. They called me the agent of CIA, the agent of MI6, the agent of even Donald Trump. So. <laughs> They label me anyway, but they cannot keep me silent. So what they did, they went to my mother. They interrogated my 70-year-old mother. They interrogated her for hours to stop her from sharing her love with me. That break me, because I know that my mother didn't do anything. Right. And my mother is a brave woman. She always says that. Yeah, I believe in hijab, I wear hijab, but I don't want to force you hijab. And she didn't want to disown me, and that is her crime. That is why I never want to cry, I, ne I never want to show them that you, are you broke my heart, but I want to make the government cry to understand that this is 21st century, and what we want, women in Iran and Saudi Arabia, we want to have dignity, we want to have freedom of choice, we are not criminals. We are human beings. And we want the rest of the world to understand that. Fighting for our dignity, we have to pay this price. And don't keep silent. When you go to my beautiful country, when you hear women in Saudi Arabia and in Iran being harassed, their family being harassed, don't keep silent. I don't want you to cry for us. I don't want you to come and save us. But understand that when people are paying price, do not patronize their cause by saying that this is a small issue. Because we are not fighting for a small piece of cloth. We are fighting for our identity, for our, for our dignity. When women go to my country, the female politicians who wear hijab, and they say, this is your culture, we want to respect your culture, they're insulting a nation. Hmm. Even I had admiration for the New Zealand Prime Minister to show the, her solidarity with Muslim women. I wanted to hug her. But by wearing hijab, you have to be smart and understand that this is not just a small piece of cloth. This, when this is in the hand of the Muslim, the extremists, in the hand of the Islamic government, in the hand of Saudi Arabia, or those who oppress us, then this is not just a small piece of cloth. This is the most visible symbol of oppression. You have to understand that when Muslim women fighting against compulsory hijab do not see this 
a sign of being a Muslim woman. I want to show you why I cannot oh. keep silent. Yeah, look, go ahead. Look, in Iran, women are doing this. I brought my stick to show you that. Women are doing this. One of the women who put the headscarf on a stick and waved it like that. You know what happened to her? She got disappeared. We don't know what happened to her. We don't know where she is. Nobody knows where Vida Mavahid is. 29 people repeated her protest. We don't know what happened to them. Yesterday, they arrested 23-year-old girl Yasaman Aryani. Her mother ran after her. They arrested her mother as well. We don't know what happened to her. What I want you, what actually Oprah said here in the same stage last night. She said, if you want to save the planet, first save yourself. Female politicians, feminists, if you want to save the planet, first save yourself. When you go to Iran, stand up for your own dignity. Do not obey compulsory hijab laws. Don't say that this is a law. You have to respect the law because it's slavery used to be legal. That's thank all I want. Thank you. Show your solidarity. Thank you, Masi, and thank you, Muley. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. And thank you all. Oh, all right. Yep. Thank you.